Greedy, thieving preachers of lies are getting more and more desperate than ever before. Whereas they used to be more subtle about it, now they're getting overtly mean and ugly. Some preachers have begun to resort to social pressure and threats of shunning and ostracism to suck more tithe money out of the congregation. Some preachers ask all the tithers to come forward to make a stand for the Lord, leaving the holdouts to sit exposed where everyone can see them and know who they are. Another shaming tactic is to actually read out the names of non-tithers. It doesn't matter to them that Jesus said your giving is to be done in secret. So how can your giving or tithing be in secret if careful records are kept by the church secretary and you're required to fill out envelopes so your pastor knows just how much you donate? This public shaming for failure to keep a man-made tithing commandment on money is an abomination as my sight. It often goes on repeatedly, week after week after week, to put the thumb screws of emotional torture on my battered sheep who are struggling to pay bills and keep a roof over their heads. Well, two can play at that public shame game. Those evil preachers will someday be paraded in front of angels and saints as fools and rejects for rejecting everything my son taught about love. I will publicly humiliate them before all the hosts of heaven and give them a taste of the same degrading treatment they dished out to poor, weak, ignorant souls on earth. I am incensed with rage, saith the Lord. I have watched some who once loved me get so badly burnt by preacher lies and threats that they sadly turn their back on anything even remotely resembling church. They just came to the conclusion that they couldn't afford Jesus anymore. Others lose all peace and a part of their first love toward me as they grudgingly write out a check for 10% of their hard-earned paychecks and grumble about the necessities they must do without for yet another week. Nothing works better for those beastly buzzards in the pulpit than holding the threat of the curse of Malachi over people's heads. But any wise person will at least read the beginning of a book to find out what it's all about and to whom it's addressed. Where are the honest ministers of my word who preach on Malachi chapter 1 and admit it's a book primarily addressed to the priests of Israel? It was the priests being reprimanded for despising my holy name, not the congregational worshipers. If pulpit ministers are so eager to identify with the corrupt priesthood of an Israel gone astray from me, then why aren't they also eager to claim the rebukes addressed to that priesthood in the book of Malachi? My prophet Malachi did not utter this prophecy for the benefit of 21st century Christian charlatans who wanted to use this word as a club to pound new covenant believers over the head with in order to extort money out of them. Parasites. If it's a curse those religious thieves want, then a curse they shall have. Paul the Apostle said it would be fitting and just that those who troubled my church with circumcision and law-keeping should go ahead and take their own medicine. They are deliberately lining their own pockets by mingling Old Testament law with buzzwords from the New Testament era and passing that off as the gospel I suffered and died to provide for you. They want slavery and fear for you, not love and liberty. They want you to toss and turn all night long, worried that unless you rush to the ATM machine and get out God's tithe, I'll reject you forever from my kingdom. But it's them I shall reject. Those who beat their fellow servants and abuse fellow Christians shall have their portion with unbelievers and be cast into outer darkness. Their end shall be a most terrible one. Those sly foxes shall be a portion for foxes, and the worm shall feed sweetly upon them. I look down from heaven and notice something peculiar. Preachers are mad about Malachi, but they ignore most of the book as they zero in on just three or four pet verses. But just two verses before that famous and well-loved and misused, twisted and misquoted segment, 
Malachi 3, 8 to 10, you'll discover just who I am speaking to. Like so many other Mosaic Law treatises in my word, those few verses are yanked out of context and put onto my redeemed church as a burden I never meant for them to bear. Verse 6 explicitly states that I am addressing the sons of Jacob, the Israelites. I am not addressing the sons of Japan or China, the sons of the Apache Indians, the Eskimos, or any other foreign nation here. I am speaking to the descendants of Israel, plain and simple, and only under the terms and conditions of the Old Testament, and not under the New. If the law of Moses is no longer in effect for any Christian, be they Jew or Gentile, then how dare modern fishers for funds hold over the heads of my beloved people the curses which pertained only to that old law? That's just as insidious and callous as threatening people with my judgment for failure to bring in the half shekel temple tax or a bullock for a sin offering. Instead of worrying about an obsolete curse which does not pertain to any of you in these last days before my appearing, please pay more attention to what is clearly stated under your covenant. The only curse you can ever incur as a Christian, believers, springs from trying to go back to serving under the old law of Moses. Why? Because under the new covenant of grace I took all the curse upon myself. But when you begin to keep old Mosaic laws to earn or keep my favor, you automatically depart from the sphere of my grace and return to the law, the land of bondage where the curse is found. It is then that dead curse of Malachi is reactivated in a person's life along with every other curse that can be found under the old law for imperfect keeping of it. The law is an indivisible unit. You must is a law principle, not a grace principle. If you attach yourself to just one link of the old law, you attach yourself to the whole chain. Don't deceive yourselves, my people. Even those who boast of keeping the tithing law today risk my judgment for imperfectly keeping it. I never commanded tithing on wages of any kind, only tithing on the produce of the land of Israel. Today's tithing is never suspended during the seventh or Sabbath year of rest as it was in ancient Israel, nor is it suspended during the Jubilee year every 50 years. The tithe is not given every third year exclusively to the poor of the land as I commanded under the old law. Nowhere did I ever authorize tithes to be used to construct fancy buildings or feed anyone's lust for luxuries. Over and over I made myself clear in both testaments. I prefer mercy to sacrifice. Where is the mercy in that cruel preacher who shames non-tithers from the pulpit? Does that spiritual tyrant not fear the Lord and the rebuke I shall speak to him or her in that day they stand before me in the judgment? You can be brought back under the bondage of the old law by keeping an alien version of the tithe, compulsory extortion of 10% of your livelihood by men in fancy suits who drive fancy cars, take fancy vacations, live in fancy homes, and speak fancy religious ease each Sunday to squeeze more and more money out of you. Galatians 3.10 clearly warns my people that whoever seeks to be justified through keeping the law is in terrible danger of suffering from the curse which comes from imperfectly keeping the old law. Preachers forever strive to bring you under submission. That seems to be oh so spiritual, but what they really want is to bring you under bondage to be their slaves. But beware of bowing your necks to preachers to allow them to put that yoke of bondage upon you ever again. That includes the tithing law. Tithing only pertained to those who sprang from the loins of Abraham and lived before the cross ushered in the new covenant. Christ fulfilled, or fully satisfied, all the demands of, all the types of the law, 
and the shadow of old things which have passed away must no longer be bound upon my people ever again. My people are too intimidated to judge those in their midst who are trying to rob them. Think it not strange that secular authorities are investigating certain ministries to see whether they are misusing funds appropriated for orphanages, mission work, or other noble causes. My people have effectively been bound by lies and are too afraid to speak against the rotting cancer of religious fraud that is sapping the vitality from my body. So I have been forced to use outsiders to help me with my house cleaning. Sad, isn't it? Someday my church will judge the angels. But today they feel compelled to turn a blind eye to those who are deceiving and robbing them. Spiritual deceivers are spiritual gigolos coming between me and my bride, the church. They are trying to force my redeemed ones back under a dead law to whom they are no longer married. They are spiritual butchers with surgical instruments who want only to circumcise the gullible with just a little bit of my law to cut off just a little bit of their liberty in Christ Jesus. Those luxury-loving plagues on my body look upon their treasures with pleasure. The multitude of their fancy shoes, each pair worn only once and then discarded. The beautiful gowns worn once or twice and then sold at thrift shops for a publicity photo. The elegantly carved furniture crafted from the rarest woods. The sweeping drapes of fine fabric, the beautiful artwork, the fleets of fancy cars, the swimming pools, the inspirational gardens and unnecessary horse farms, Christian fun parks, the jet trips around the world, all at donor's expense, the pilgrimages to where Jesus walked. Well, let me tell you something. Such crooks and thieves could never in a thousand years walked where I walked. I walked up a hill, bleeding and broken in body, to pay the awful price for your sins. When was the last time any fancy preacher helped you out when your back was against the wall? I died for you. They won't even part with a dime to help you out in your darkest hour. And when I took a look at the luxuries of these rich servants, guess what I see? Each treasure looted out of my house represents the prayers and tears of desperate hurting Christians who gave out of their want in hopes of a miracle of deliverance. The luxuries of rich thieves are purchased with the blood, sweat, and tears of my people. In some cases, people have gone without sufficient food to pay for luxuries enjoyed by the rich parasite preachers. A certain number have slowly starved to death and done without winter heat and medicine, especially some elderly saints who felt that since they were already close to heaven, their earthly well-being didn't count anyway. What a deception of Satan! I would have been furious with any religious peddler who tried to rob my aged mother of her daily bread money by appealing to her love for God and her tenderness of heart. These covetous, spoiled jet-setters squander my resources on Arabian racehorses, pedigreed dogs, and air-conditioned kennels. I specifically warned in my word that the children's bread must not be cast to dogs. Money which ought to be devoted to feeding your family must not buy dogs for greedy dogs who can never have enough. Ordinary people must sweat for their money, but praying serpents who hoodwink the righteous think they're too good to soil their soft hands with a good, honest, hard day's work. So they shed Phony crocodile tears as a cunning way to get an easy life of luxuries. Many neglected prayer requests are sealed in offering envelopes sprinkled with the real tears of people undergoing fierce trials of faith. I have called you out of the darkness of bondage into the perfect liberty of my spirit. So don't be afraid to question your most cherished religious traditions my people ignorance is not bliss in matters of faith ignorance is destruction